dive in now. Let's find out what God's Word has for us this morning. Let's go, first of all, to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. And I've entitled uh, this sermon, or these couple of sermons that we're probably going to end up doing, uh, Satan's Supercharged Superman, the Antichrist. Satan's Supercharged Superman called the Antichrist. Guys, I'm telling you, we're living in a world that is truly coming unhinged. In fact, I just read about two, two uh, young children in a school who quote-unquote misgendered their classmate and was suspended for five days for that. I've got news for you. The Word of God says in Genesis, in the beginning God created them male and female. Those are the only two genders that exist on this planet, male and female. Amen? That's what God's Word says. So listen. If you got a problem with that, your problem's not with the preacher. Your problem's not with anybody else on this planet. Your problem's with the Lord because he's the one that wrote the book. Amen? The Bible. He's the cook. I didn't cook that book. I'm his waiter, and I'm to serve it hot and fresh. Amen? So if your problem, you got a problem with that, your problem's with the Lord. But transgenderism, man, it's a denial of reality. Man, we're living in a world where people are denying the reality of Scripture because everything that the Bible says is reality. Amen? Amen. And this is where we need to go. This is our, our focus. God's Word, God's holy, infallible, inerrant, indestructible, eternal Word. Amen? Amen. We praise God for the solid rock of His Word. Let's go to Revelation, and let's read in chapter 13. And the Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now this is John, the revelator. He's on the island of Patmos. He's been exiled. And Jesus Christ gives him to the apocalypse, or the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he comes to him, and he says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his ten crowns, and upon his head, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. This is talking about the Antichrist. John is giving the description of the Antichrist. Revelation 13 also correlates with Daniel chapter number uh, 8, and Daniel chapter 7 as well, when it gives a description of this beast, the Antichrist. And it says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And did you notice that the leopard, the bear, and the lion were also the attributes of Babylon? That was a lion. And then you had uh, a leopard. You had uh, Greece, the Grecian Empire. And then you had that lion, which, or you had the bear, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. So it seems that the Antichrist is going to have all the ability of those rulers infused in him. And as we do a profile on the Antichrist, as we move through this, we'll see that. And then it says this, And in, he has the mouth of the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, and that devil, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Do you see that? Let's read that part again. And the dragon, the devil, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's consider for the next few moments Satan and his supercharged Superman, the Antichrist. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. I pray now with all my heart that you'll touch me, anoint me. Lord, you'll plug me in. You'll do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own. Lord, you tell us in your word the flesh profits absolutely nothing, but it's your spirit that quickens. It's your spirit that makes alive. And I pray that your word would go forth in power, which is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I pray that you would pierce our hearts with your word. I pray that you would use this message to encourage your people. Lord, to infuse hope. Lord, to put a spring in your people's step. Lord, to be the soul winners that you've called us to be. Because, Lord, the days are short and the days are getting evil. And, Lord, I just pray with all my heart, if there's one here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would turn from their sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, putting all of their trust in him. For you tell us in your word, we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, at least anyone should boast. So, Lord, I pray that you would grant them repentance, that they would be willing to turn from their sin and self and put their trust in you. Lord, you tell us in Romans 10, all those that call upon your name, believing in their heart that God raised them from the dead, confessing you as Lord, shall be saved. So, Lord, I pray that this would be the day that one would come to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well... If the Antichrist were here physically and personally, now this is me, this is my personal opinion, I believe that the Antichrist is alive and well and breathing air on planet Earth today. Looking at how all the events are lining up, if you look at all the prophetic uh, chess pieces that God has on the table, man, lifeblood is being pumped into all of them. Some have already been moved, some are in the process of being moved, and some are waiting to be moved, but man, every chess piece prophetically is on the table. I can 
stand here and say that today. If you look at what's taking place right now uh, in Denmark, I just learned that overnight, without warning, they shut everybody's phone off. They can't buy. They can't sell. They can't do anything. They can't have a bank account. They can't go to the vet. They can't make a doctor appointment. They can't do anything because they said, if you want your phone turned on and you want all this back in your life, you have to go get a digital ID. And guys, I'm telling you, they're pushing that agenda right now. Man, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this country, they just turned your phone off and said, if you want your phone turned back on, you got to come down here and get a digital ID. This world's going digital currency. It's going digital ID. And it's already taking place in Denmark. Man, I think it's Ethiopia or South, South Africa has been given $8 million to go to this digital currency and digital ID as well. So, guys, it's coming together. Daniel chapter 12 says in the last days, people will go to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Man, knowledge is, is doubling every 12 hours now. What used to take years and years is now taking 12 hours. Wow. AI technology. AI right now can take your Wi-Fi. They just proved it. Then give it a camera and said, where, where, where are these people in this room? So what AI did is went into the AI, used the radio wave that AI had to make an image of where people were in the room. So now AI can take your Wi-Fi and turn it into a spy camera if they want to without even having a lens. Wow. AI has been hooked up to people's brains. These people are told to think of an image. One woman was thinking of a giraffe. AI, they asked AI, what is she thinking? And then AI showed an image of a giraffe. So, guys, the technology is here. Man, globalism is being put into place. And the two big countries that are in the way of globalism and the Antichrist drawing in the net and Satan drawing in the net is America and Israel. That's why everyone's going to hate Israel. Why? Because Israel are not globalists. God Almighty is not a globalist. How do I know that God's not a globalist? Because the Bible says he promised Israel the promised land. Did he promise that land to anybody else? He promised it to who? To the nation of Israel. Amen? Boy, Satan is the one that wants to rule the world. And he wants to use his wallpaper hanger, this supercharged Superman called the Antichrist, to do it. So let's find out and let's dig in about this. So if you were to interview the Antichrist, the problem with that would be you would get nothing but fake news. Amen? Because he's a liar and a deceiver and he's known as the son of perdition. If you were to interview Satan himself, you wouldn't get anything but fake news from him either. Amen? There's nobody that you can interview on this planet that knows except for one. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows who Satan is. He knows who the Antichrist is. That's why we go to the wonderful, holy, infallible, inerrant indestructible word of God to know who our enemy is. Are you with me? All right, now notice what it says here. I was going to dive directly into the Antichrist. I've got five or six pages of notes right here. But the Lord reminded me that I don't want the focus to be on the Antichrist. Of course, we don't want the focus to be on, on Satan. The focus is always to be on Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Now, when you're studying prophecy... We don't study it to be a sign watcher. No, we study it so that God motivates us. He puts hope. He puts a spring in our set so that we can be better soul winners. Amen? Amen. Because the days are short. Man, the days are getting evil. Boy. There was a police officer in San Francisco. You talk about perilous times. You talk about men being lovers of self. I mean, we are here, guys. We are here right now. They had two people walking around indecently, and that's all I'll say, in public. And then the cop was saying, a cop was asked, are you not going to arrest them for walking around indecent? And they said they can do whatever they want except for a few things. And I'm paraphrasing, that's not an exact quote, but except they don't do a few things. This is where we're at in America today. This is right here in our own country. Wow. Guys, I'm telling you, man. We're, we're, I think we're well, we're, we're, we're in the beginning of the end, but I think we're moving in a lot more into the beginning. We're, we're getting in slowly into the meat and potatoes, but you can see all the pieces coming together. But notice what it says. How do I know that the Antichrist is just a wallpaper hanger? He's just a puppet. Notice what it says in verse thir chapter 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, the nations having seven heads and ten horns, representing ten kings. Ten kingdoms, this European nation, this revived Roman Empire, if you will. And then it says, and upon his horn, ten crowns, and upon his head, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, 
Boy, the dragon and the devil gave him his who? Power. Who gave it to him? Man, Satan and his seat and great authority. So, man, Satan is the one who's really the true culprit behind the scenes. You see, everything that Satan is invisibly, man, the Antichrist is going to try to manifest visibly. As Satan possesses this man, empowers this man, the satanic diabolical ruler, the reason why he has so much charisma and so much wisdom is not in his own ability. It's because of his father, Satan, giving him that ability. So that's what we need to understand, who we're really truly dealing with. So let's find out. Before we look at a profile of the Antichrist, let's go back and get reminded. Let's have a quick refresher of who Satan is. Go in your Bible now to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, for time's sake, I want you to go home and study this yourself. But in verses 1 through 10 of Ezekiel, now Ezekiel was a prophet that warned of, of the judgment to come, but he was also uh, a prophet that was during the exile. And his contemporaries were Jeremiah. Jeremiah was 20 years older than Ezekiel was. Uh, Daniel was also his contemporary. Uh, he was there when he was 25. He was deported on the second dispersion that came. The first wave, then he came with the second wave. And about 10,000 of the elite of Jerusalem were captured, and he was brought with them. And so he was there in captivity. And so he preached against the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, different things like that. He talks about the glory of God, the wrath of God, but he also talks about the restoration of God. So Ezekiel, man, is a, is a mighty prophet of God, and then God gives him this vision. And, and a part of Ezekiel, God tells him, I want you to preach against the ten countries that surround Israel. One of those was Lebanon today, or what was known back then as Tyre. All right, and there was an evil king named King Tyre. He was a man. He was a tyrant. He believed and convinced himself that he was God, wanted to be worshipped as God. Boy, starting to get a picture of who that might sound like, right? Well, he was a real king, and God said, "I'm going. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your nation down, and I'm going to humble you because he was guilty of the sin of pride because he went around believing that he was God." So. Study that yourself in verse 10. This king trafficked and he peddled his philosophies and all these things and got many people to follow him into his destructive ways. So the Lord pronounces judgment on this king. But then something very interesting happens in chapter 28, verse 11. Verse 11. Now, when you look at verses 2 through 9, Ezekiel is talking to an earthly king. But something very interesting happens when you get to verse 11 and following. God pulls back a spiritual curtain and says, Now listen, I want to really show you the culprit behind who King Tyre really is. Who's the one that's uh, tempting King Tyre? Who's the one that's pushing King Tyre to be evil and to do all these things that he's doing? Well, God pulls back the curtain and shows us that it's Satan behind the scenes. So verses 11 and following... The Lord pulls back the spiritual curtain and says, I'm going to show you the real culprit behind the scenes. Who's behind King Tyre? But as the Lord does this, man, he teaches us and reveals to us a lot about who Satan is. And we need to be reminded of who he is. So let's find out and dive in what God's word says about Satan. All right? Now, notice this is not uncommon in scripture. We call it double addressing. You remember how Jesus was talking to Peter? But at the same time, he was actually talking to Satan. He said, get behind thee, Satan. Remember that? He was talking to Satan. So he was addressing Satan, but he was also talking to Peter. Well, this is the same way. He's addressing an earthly king, but at the same time, he's addressing Satan, the one that's behind the scene, that culprit, if you will. So let's find out, and let's look at a profile and a description of Satan. Let's look behind the spiritual curtain and trace Satan's hoofs, friends, and see what we can learn about this creature called Satan. Now, if you studied your Bible for any length of time, you know that Satan is a cherubim. You can read about that in Ezekiel, as we're going to read about that here right now. But he's a cherubim, and the Word of God tells us that a cherubim has the feet like a cow. He has hooves for feet. And that's why you get the old saying when you used to read about those murder detectives and how they used to try to find the murderer. They said, we're looking and scanning for old Satan, Satan's hooves his murderous footprints, if you will. And so we're going to see his murderous footprints as we study who he is. So first of all, let's dive in. Look at verse 15 with me. God's going to talk to Satan, but let's read a little bit so we can get perspective. All right, let's, let's start reading in verse number 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up lamentations upon the king of Tyrus, 
and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God. Now he's going to pull back the curtain here. He's going to talk about Satan now. Listen to what he says about Satan. It says, So the man take up lamentations against King Tyrus and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealeth up the sum of full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. In other words, you were the seal. You were the full, you were full of wisdom when I created you, and you were the perfection. Man, you were the apex of beauty. Man, Satan, or God made Satan a very beautiful creature. One of his names is Lucifer, and it means the shining one. And that's why the Bible says in Corinthians that the Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. And it's no wonder that his ministers can also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. So he's deceptive. So the first thing that we need to understand about Satan is he's a created being. Number one, he's a created being. You were perfect in the ways from the day that you were created. So God tells us that he's a created being. How was he created? Verse 13 says that he was created in perfection. Now let's look at some of his perfections. Look at the second part of verse 12. It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So out of all the known created beings in Scripture, Satan is described as the beautiful as all. Wow. If you were to ask the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise God, in your opinion, Lord, what would you say is perfect beauty as far as a creature that you made? He would look over and say, look at Satan. Boy. And we're going to learn more about him as we move through this. So he would point at Lucifer and say, look at him. See, when people think of Satan, they think of him as being ugly, scary, a pitchfork, he's red, he's got horns, he's terrifying looking. Satan loves that because that's not what Satan looks like. The Word of God says he disguises himself as an angel of light, not some horrible, heinous thing that the world makes him out to be. You see, Satan loves it when people ignore him and, and, and say that he doesn't exist. He loves that. But he also loves it when people depict him in ways that are not representative of him either because he uses it to keep people in deception. Wow. Now, as beautiful as Satan is, is on the outside, I believe Satan is ugly on the inside. Amen? Boy. So we've seen he was created in perfection. But what else does the Bible say? Well, God also gave him a perfect place of habitation. Let's look at his habitation. Look at the privilege that God gave Satan before he fell. Look at verse 13. You were in the garden. You were in the Eden, the garden of God. Now, we know for sure that King Tyre was not in the garden of Eden. Now, there's two gardens, I believe, that this is referencing. The real physical garden, we know that Satan was there in the beginning because Genesis tells us that. He possessed the serpent. That's why he's known as the serpent of old or the dragon, if you will. But we also are going to look at a garden that seems like it's called the Garden of Eden in heaven as well. But notice what it says. Look at the middle of verse 14. It says, You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. That word fiery means brilliant stones, the brilliant stones. Think about the Shekinah glory of God shining in heaven. The Bible says that the city was made out of pure gold. The street was made out of pure gold as transparent glass. And think about the Shekinah glory shining through all of that. Amen? Wow. Boy, so it says that you were on the mountain of God, walked back and forth. So, man, what a what a what a privilege he had! What a holy habitation! What a place of perfection! He was made in perfection. He lived in a place of perfection. His habitation. But let's look at his bright depiction. Let's look at his bright depiction. Look at verse thirteen. Look at the middle of verse thirteen. It says, "Every precious stone was your covering: the sardis, the ruby, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and jasper." Sapphire, turquoise, turquoise, emerald with gold. Now, scholars are divided. Some people say maybe it's a cake that he has that has all these jewels and gold in it. But most scholars believe that somehow, some way, man, this is the, these jewels and this gold is, is part of his body. It's, it's intertwined in him somehow. Now, I've never seen Satan, so I don't know, so I can't say it does say the Lord, but I'm just giving you two schools of thought on who and what this might be. But we do know that he is highly decorated with brilliance, if you will. Brilliant stones, bright stones. Wow, what a depiction. So we see that he was created in perfection. Man, God gave him a perfect place of habitation. Man, he had a bright depiction. But let's look at his occupation. What was his occupation? Well, we've seen how perfect and beautiful Satan was made. His habitation was heaven. But what did, what did God have, what, why did God create Satan for originally? Well, now guys, we can't be Super dogmatic, but, but look at verse 13 with me. Notice what it says, the last part. It says, the workmanship of your timbrels, 
and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. So when you look at that word workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, man, it talks about like Satan's vocal cords. It talks about Satan having some type of musical ability. And that's where you probably even heard as a kid that Satan was probably created to be the choir director of heaven. And we know that Satan does have major influence over the music industry today. If you scan the music industry, man, you'll see the, you'll see the uh, fingerprints of Satan all over it. Boy. In fact, there's a documentary called The Dangers of Rock and Roll, Hell's Bell 1 and Hell's Bell Part 2. And he goes in and he shows the dangers of music and the lyrics that these people are, 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 are producing because a lot of it is anti-Christ. It's anti-God. Boy, so Satan definitely has influence over music. There's no doubt about that. Now, was that his position? Absolutely in heaven, I can't say. But it lends itself to that. But he also not only had a great occupation, if that was his occupation indeed, but man, he also, boy, he had a great position in heaven. Man, he had a privileged position in heaven before he fell. How do I know? Look at verse 14. It says, you were the anointed cherub that covered. Now, we know that King Tyre, the earthly king, was not a cherubim. He was a man. So we know he's talking about Satan. And it says that you were the anointed cherub. Do you see that? This is the only scripture in all of the Word of God that teaches us that there was an angel that was anointed. He's the only one in scripture that is the anointed angel or the anointed cherub. Now, when you study cherubim, Cherubim, there were two of them on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and their wings touched one another. You remember that? And God dwelt above the top of the Ark of the Covenant. So they have like a guardian position as well. You remember in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Remember how God sent a cherubim, and he sent a flaming sword to guard the way of the tree of life? At least they reach out and take the fruit and live forever, the Bible said. Why? Because God knew that if he took of the tree of life, and they partook of that in that sinful nature, that sinful fallen state of theirs. They would live forever in this flesh. Could you imagine everybody from Adam and Eve till now never dying? What would this world be like? And they would be full of Hitler, King is Kong, and all these evil people, all these evil rulers. Would it not be chaos? Boy. So that's why God set that cherubim to guard the way of the tree of life. So it seems that their position is guardianship. They protect the holiness of God. Not that God's holiness needs protecting. Don't get me wrong. I'm just using human language, if you will. But they're guardians of the throne, if you will. Boy, he had a privileged position. The anointed cherub. In fact, the Bible teaches us that he argued with the archangel Michael over the body of Moses in the book of Jude. Now, most scholars believe the reason why they were arguing over the body of Moses in the book of Jude was because Satan wanted Moses wanted to know where Moses was buried so that he could probably erect or have people erect some type of monument to Moses so that people would worship Moses rather than the Lord. Now that's not to say the Lord, that's my opinion. A lot of scholars believe that. Why? Because the Bible says that God himself buried Moses. Man did not bury Moses. God himself buried Moses. Study it yourself. Read it. And there was an argument that took place. And what did the archangel Michael say to Satan when he was arguing about the body of Moses? He said, the archangel Michael, who we know is the general of heaven, amen, because he and his angels cast Satan down at the midpoint in the tribulation period. And so he's going to be cast down to heaven so that we know Michael, the archangel, is the general of heaven as far as the armies go, as far as the angelic host. And the archangel Michael looked at Satan and said, he didn't dare, he didn't dare make a railing judgment against Satan, but said, let the Lord rebuke you. Satan. So it just shows you that even the Archangel Michael has respect not for the person of Satan, but for the position that Satan's in. Boy. And then you get these preachers on TV that say, I bind you with a chain. Well, I, I want to ask those preachers, well, it must be an awful long chain. Because he's wearing people out everywhere. Amen? Boy, God didn't call you to bind Satan. He called you to pray and ask you to protect him to protect you from Satan. His rod, his staff brings me comfort. Not your prayer and your chain. Amen? Boy, your prayer does, but your chain doesn't. I would rather have the Lord's staff and his rod to comfort me. Amen? Amen? Amen. Why? Because Satan's a big bag wolf and we're sheep. And what sheep do you know can fight a wolf? Can a can, 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 can hundred sheep beat up a wolf? 
Can a 2,000 sheep beat up a wolf? No. That's why we need Jesus. He's our shepherd. Satan's a big bad wolf. Amen? Boy. So, let's move on. Oh, man. Oh. So, he's a created being. And we see that he was created in perfection. He was given a privileged habitation. We see in his bright depiction. We see his occupation. We see this privileged position. So, he was a created being. And given all these things, but number two, let's not forget, he was also a conceited being. He's a conceited being. How do I know? Well, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17, notice what it says in verse 17. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now notice in verse 17, the very top of it. It says, thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. In other words, Satan got to looking at himself in the mirror of heaven and got enamored with himself, fell in love with himself, and then Isaiah chapter 14 kicks in. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. So we see that he's a conceited being. But go over there to Isaiah 14 now. And let's start in verse number 9. Notice what it says in verse number 9, talking about Satan. It says, Help from beneath thee is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. So he's talking about Satan being cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And then he says, It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Are you become like us? Your pomp, your pride is brought down to the grave, and the noise of your vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worm covers thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart. So after he gets looking at himself in the mirror, boy, he, he, gets, to think, he, gets, he gets to have a conversation with himself, thinking, he's, boy, he's something. And let's look at the conversation that he had to himself and why he was kicked out of heaven. It says in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now, the word clouds there, as most scholars believe, that it's, it's glory. In other words, he wanted his glory to supersede the glory of the Lord himself. Boy. And we know, as you study this in context, it seems that that word cloud lends itself to that. The glory cloud, if you will. Now, let's keep reading. It says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. That's talking about Revelation chapter 20. So the word of God tells us that he's a conceited being. He says, I will ascend into heaven, basically saying, I'm going to occupy God's throne. I'm going to usurp the authority of God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Do you see that? Boy, what does that mean? That means that he wants all the angels of God to worship him. The stars of God there are referring to angels. I want all the heavenly hosts to worship me, is what Satan is saying. Boy, notice, as we keep reading, it says, uh, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Look at verse 16. They that, sh they that shall see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the one that made the earth to tremble, that the, 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 did shake the kingdoms? Look at verse 17. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Boy. So the Word of God clearly teaches us, man, that Satan's agenda was, I'm going to sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Uh, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High, he says, the five eye wills of Satan. So he's a conceited being. He's guilty of pride. Amen? So he's a created being. He's a conceited being. But let's not forget number three. Satan is also a corrupted being. He's a corrupted being. He's corrupt from head to toe. Boy, he's evil incarnate. Look at verse 15. Look at the last part. Till iniquity was found in you. You see that? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go, go, go back to uh, Ezekiel. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We're, we're still here in Isaiah uh, verse 14. No, I'm, we're in Ezekiel 28. Go back to verse... Verse 15, Ezekiel 28, I, I apologize. He's a corrupted being. Till iniquity was found in you. Verse 17 says, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Verse 18, You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. So the word of God says that as he got corrupt, 
as he wanted to take over and usurp the authority of God, man, he began to peddle and traffic, just like the King Tyre on earth began to peddle and traffic his philosophies that he was God and wanted to be worshipped as God. Well, Satan also, as God pulls back the curtain, is saying to us, hey, listen, he's beginning to peddle to, the, to these angels in heaven what his agenda is. And what does the Bible say in Revelation? He took how many angels with him? A third of the angels with him. So he also peddled in traffic, just like we see King Tyre on earth did. So he's a corrupt being from head to toe. But number four, he's also a crafty being. He's a crafty being. Look at verse 16. By the abundance of your trafficking, trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. That word trading is trafficking. He began to peddle his trade and talk about his sin with others and appeal to these angels and a third of the angels followed with him. Wow. So as a result, as we study this, we see that he's a created being. We see that he's a conceited being. He's a corrupted being. And his corruption leads to his craftiness. Boy, his craftiness. He's a crafty being. The Bible says that he was made full of wisdom, but he uses that wisdom for evil and nefarious purposes. Amen? Man, I tell you what, if you look at the Holocaust and how evil that was, and you've heard me make the statement, I forgot what general showed up there, but as he was looking around and it dawned on him what really took place during the Holocaust, he was a man that looked at and said, the evil that took place here was so evil there's not even a name for it. You can't even put a name on it, how evil it was. And I'm telling you, that's Satan just getting started. If he had his way, he would wipe out everybody on this planet. And Satan's, Satan wants to rule people, and then he wants to ruin them. He wants to rule you and then ruin you. That's his whole agenda. He wants to bring everybody he can to hell with him. Why? Because he hates God. He can't get a hold of God, but he can mess with the object of God's love, and that's people. Amen? Oh, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's a crafty being. But his craftiness led, number five, and I'm done, led to his condemnation. He's a condemned being. Praise God that he's condemned. Amen? Amen. How do I know? Look at what it says in the middle of verse 17. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Look at the middle of verse 18. By the iniquity of your trading thereof, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you. It turns you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all when the, who saw, saw you. All who know among the peoples are astonished at you. You become a whore and shall be no more forever. So in other words, God says that during Judgment Day, when you look at Satan, everyone on Judgment Day is going to look at Satan narrowly and say, Is this the one? Really? Is this the culprit? Is this the one that destroyed the nations? Is he really the one that did all these things? He's really not that big of a big shot, is he? Compared to you, Lord. Amen. In fact, it's a sin to compare anything to the Lord. You know why? Because nothing can be compared to him. He's unique. Amen. 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 Boy. So he's a condemned being. And we praise God that the Lord kicked him out of heaven. Amen. Well, guys, I'm going to have to stop there. And the next Sunday, we'll pick up on Satan's supercharged Superman, his wallpaper hanger, the Antichrist. But I wanted you to see today where, man, the Antichrist gets his charisma, gets his power, gets his ability. So let's never forget how evil Satan is and that he is the ultimate Philistine. He's the ultimate enemy of the Christian. Amen? Boy, he is. And he wants nothing more to ruin your testimony and to keep people from putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all he wants. That's his agenda. Steal, kill, murder, and destroy. Amen? So let's keep that in mind. And praise God that we have him. That the Lord is my shepherd. Amen? I shall not want. Amen? Well, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Man, the word of God is green. That's the green pasture. The word of God for our heart. He leads us by still waters. Man, he gives us that drink. Amen? Boy, he sure does. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Man, praise the Lord. Amen? I don't know about you, but man, when you see this world falling apart, you see how corrupt this country's become from head to toe, and you see everything coming together, it's amazing. But you have the peace of God in your heart, amen? Well, you can't buy that. You can't put a price tag on that. Man, God shed his blood for you to have that, amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you so much for your great love and your word. 
Lord, I just pray now if there's anybody here today that's lost and doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, as we have this invitation, as we're about to stand, these altars are going to be open for prayer. I'm going to ask you right now, is there a time in your life where you know for a fact that you have repented of your sin? You came to the Lord because God told you in his word, you have sinned against me. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, the standard of God, his holiness, his commandments. And the wages of sin, breaking his commandments, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, the Bible says. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm asking you, has there been a time in your life where you confess to the Lord that you're a guilty sinner and you know that you couldn't save yourself? The Bible says you're saved by grace. God's unconditional love through faith. That means putting your trust in God's word and what God says about his son and how he died on the Calvary's cross for you. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus the Lord. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. Please, anyone should boast. So I'm asking you, have you confessed to the Lord that you're a sinner? Have you admitted to him? And have you said, Lord, I repent of my sin and I truly surrender all of me to all of you. I'm turning from sin. I'm turning from self. And I'm putting all of my trust in you. You're shed blood on Calvary's cross and the fact that you were raised from the dead. And I call upon your name. Have you done that from your heart? Do you know for a fact that you're saved? The Bible says in Romans 8, 16, that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that you're a child of God. Do you have that Bible assurance this morning? He wants you to have that. And if you don't have that, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. This prayer doesn't save you by itself. Jesus Christ saves you. This is not a magic formula. You're praying to the Lord Jesus. He's the one that saves you. And there is salvation in no one else except for him. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I know I can't save myself. And Lord, I come to you right now. And I repent of my sin and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin against you Lord I believe that you died and Lord I believe that you were buried and I believe that you were raised from the dead and Lord I call upon your name to save me and to forgive me I repent of my sin I receive you as my Lord and Savior would there be anybody here today no one looking around, I'm not embarrassed you, I'm not calling you, but no one looking around as the piano begins to play. Raise your hand if you said, Brother Dave, I prayed to receive Christ for the first time in a real way today. Brother Dave, that's me. I prayed to receive Christ for the first time in a real way today. Anybody at all, I don't want to let you leave this room today without giving you an opportunity to give your heart and life to Christ. He loves you, he cares for you, he'll wash away all your sins, he'll change your life, he'll give you the greatest relationship that you can ever have, he'll give you joy unspeakable. The Bible says in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, Jesus said. Are you experiencing that abundant life of the Lord, Christian? Where's your heart for the Lord? When's the last time you prayed for a soul? When's the last time you invited somebody to this church to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ preached in this lost and dying world? Maybe there's somebody here today that says, Brother Dave, I've been praying about this church and I believe that God wants me to join. And God wants me to use the gifts and his calling in my life to help further the kingdom of God in this church, using the gift that he's given me. And all you got to do is come, and we can tell you how you can be a member of our church. But right now, I'm going to ask you if you would, no more tearing. If you stand to your feet, we'll not delay. We're going to sing hymn number 435. 435. Stand to your feet.
for those of you that don't know, he's been visiting with us here uh, for about a month now, maybe a little bit more than that. And uh, man, Brother George and I have had a great time to be able to get to know him and hear his testimony. We were able to share our testimonies. And, uh, and Brother Al, I believe you got saved 15 years ago. Is that what you said? 50 years ago. 50 years ago. 5-0. Boy, I'm getting old. My ears are not as good as they were. All right. But, man, I tell you what, he's a, he's a soul winner. He's on fire for God. Man, we're excited to have him to be a part of our church. Brother George and I heard his testimony. We interviewed him. We also shared our testimonies as well. And if you'd like to be a member of our church, we'll come visit with you. We'll share our testimony so you can know where, where, who we are and ask her any questions that you may have. But we're excited for Brother Al. Man, he's a guy that also has passion for uh, prophecy as well. And, uh, boy, I, I think we were, we were talking about that for a couple hours the other day. Man, you can get excited about that. Amen? So... If you are in favor of Brother Al being a member of our church, everybody raise your right hand and say aye. Hey, amen, brother. I'm going to have Brother Al with me in the back. I want you to extend your hand of fellowship with him and tell him that you'll be praying for him as well. Guys, we'll see you here at 5 o'clock if you're coming to the revival. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for the extra patience that you gave me today, and we'll keep on keeping on. Amen. Brother George, close us in prayer.